Somebody in the United States government understood, they realized that if this thing works the way we think it will, when we hit that red button, we're going to unleash a supernatural power. Before the final visitation of God's judgments upon the earth, there will be among the people of the Lord such a revival of primitive godliness as has not been witnessed since apostolic times. The spirit and power of God will be poured out upon his children. And they bore a straight testimony saying, you can't have it both ways, folks. You can either be united to God or you can continue being connected with sin, but you cannot have it both ways. If we're gonna stand for God at the end, we have to be able to do it alone. Without my wife, without my family, they have to be ready to do that without me. Without your church family. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the freedom that you've given us uh, in this nation at this time to come together, to open your word without fear, and to uh, study, to share, and uh, to worship you. We invite your presence here this morning. We ask that you would send your Holy Spirit, Lord, and as we look at how you have worked in the past and how you're working today, I pray that you will uh, unite our hearts and minds with yours. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I was 21, 22 years old <clears throat> and working on a construction crew uh, as I was trying to finish up college. And on this particular day, we were putting the roof on top of a three-story apartment building. And <clears throat> This was in Lincoln, Nebraska. If you've ever been in Lincoln, Nebraska, you know it's the capital of the state, and it's a very tall capital building. In fact, it's the tallest uh, state capital building in the country. And you can see the capital from most places of the city because, of course, Nebraska is like this. It's, it's pretty flat. And on this particular day, here we are, <clears throat> three, four stories up in the air, putting the, uh, the roof on. And I remember glancing uh, over toward the downtown and, and seeing the Capitol building there, not thinking much of it because it's always there, right? You see it every day. And I went back to my work, and a few minutes later, I glanced up again, and this was a clear, sunny summer day, and the Capitol building had disappeared. It was not there. Now, the sun was still shining. There were no clouds in the sky. And I remember thinking, well, that's kind of strange. I wonder where the Capitol building went. This is a big building, right? It's, it's uh, not something that is going to disappear easily. Well, I went back uh, to my work, bending over, nailing on the, the, the boards here, and about 30 seconds later, a 70 mile an hour gust of wind came slamming through our part of town and nearly blew all of us off the roof. Now, foolishly, we weren't harnessed in or anything like that. Should have been, right? Three and a half stories up in the air. So what had happened? Well, as can happen from time to time, big line of wind had been coming across the state and kicking up all of the dirt and the dust and everything else with it. And so even though it was a sunny, cloudless day, as that dust cloud and dirt cloud moved into the western part of the city where the, the state capital was, it obscured everything. And about 30 seconds later, it reached the east end of town where we were. And <clears throat> what a warning, right, and a lesson how, how easily and quickly things can change. We think that we're standing firmly. We think that we are solid in our faith, in our understanding of, of the Bible, of truth, and our relationship with God. And something happens in our life, and overnight, everything seems different. Maybe you've had that experience. If you haven't, I'm not here to bring bad news, but you probably will if you haven't had that kind of experience already. So where do we stand, right? That's what I want to look at this morning. One other much more recent illustration of how quickly things can change would be uh, President Trump's experience a week ago today, right? How quickly uh, things could change. Now, I'm not here to tell you this morning that God did or did not save his life. This is not the topic of my sermon. But in a split second, uh, not only his life, but the realities of politics in this nation could have changed instantaneously, right? Right? Now, for better or worse, 
we're still where we were, and we don't know where that's going to lead. But I want to start by reading for you this statement from the book Great Controversy. And we are going to do a Bible study this morning, but we're going to start with this statement. Before the final visitation of God's judgments upon the earth, there will be among the people of the Lord such a revival of primitive godliness as has not been witnessed since apostolic times. The spirit and power of God will be poured out upon his children. Now I'm going to start with an easy question this morning. How many of you would like to be part of a revival of primitive godliness? Amen. How many of you feel a need for that kind of experience in your life? I'll put my hand up high, right? We need this. Uh, we recognize that need personally, individually, and as we look at where uh, the church is, as we look at where society is, we recognize we need a revival. We need the Holy Spirit at work in our lives. So here's what we're told. At that time, when this revival happens, many will separate themselves from those churches in which the love of this world has supplanted love for God and His Word. Many, both of ministers and people, will gladly accept these great truths which God has caused to be proclaimed at this time to prepare a people for the Lord's second coming. So we're looking at a great revival, aren't we? A great awakening that will take place, not unlike the revival at Pentecost when the Holy Spirit was poured out, not unlike the revivals of previous generations or previous centuries where the Holy Spirit worked powerfully, whether it was through... Uh, the Protestant Reformation, or the Welsh Revival, or the Advent Awakening of the mid-1800s, we can look back in history and see how God has worked very powerfully. And I think most of us uh, would love to be part of something like this, right? Where you can see the Holy Spirit at work. But here's what we're told. The enemy of souls desires to hinder this work. And before the time for such a movement shall come, he will endeavor to prevent it by introducing a counterfeit. In those churches in which he can bring under his deceptive power, he will make it appear that God's special blessing is poured out. And he will try to do this in every single church, right? Not just in one denomination, uh, not just in one area. He will try to do it right here as well. If he can deceive us, he will do that. There will be manifest what is thought to be great religious interest. Multitudes will exult that God is working marvelously for them when the work is that of another spirit. Under religious guise, Satan will seek to extend his influence over the Christian world. Now, if you open your Bible to the book of Revelation, and we're actually not going to spend most of our time there, but if you, if you know the prophecies in Revelation, especially around chapter 13, where we look at the final events in the Mark of the Beast, the picture we get of the world is actually that the world is a very spiritual place, right? People are convinced that God is real, that God is work at work. Um, some are convinced, maybe many, that God is angry because of things that are happening in society. And so there is a push to correct where society is at. This is the picture that Revelation 13 gives us. The only problem is that Revelation reveals that many will end up following the wrong religious leadership and thereby making the wrong decisions at the end of time. And Revelation tells us that if we are going to remain faithful to God at the end of time, we're going to have to be willing to stand alone Amen. against the majority. Revelation 14 verse 12 says, Here is the patience of the saints, here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So this tells us two areas of the devil's attack at the end of time. He's going to attack God's commandments. He's going to attack God's law. He's going to attack a personal relationship with Jesus because that's how our faith is built. As we learn that God cares for me personally, he cares for you personally. He, he cares about the details of our lives. That develops faith as we realize this. The devil's going to try to discourage you in that kind of faith. And in Revelation 12, verse 17, we find one other aspect of the devil's attack. Revelation 12, verse 17. The dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed. That's the same group as these saints in the other verse we just read about. They keep the commandments of God and they have the testimony of Jesus Christ. And uh, Revelation 19, verse 10 tells us that the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. 
So the devil is also going to attack those who would serve God by trying to shake our faith in the prophetic messages that he has given to us. Three areas of attack, the commandments of God, your faith in Jesus, and our faith in the gift of prophecy. Now, <clears throat> with that as a foundation, let's review where our world has come over the last several years. And there's been a lot happening, hasn't there, in the last few years. Um, <clears throat> I guess most recently, we, we could talk about the pandemic and COVID. And, you know, that kind of seems like it's all in the past. It's forgotten, right? And we're, we're back to our lives for the most part. But uh, there were some interesting things that happened very shortly before the pandemic. In 2017, it was the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation. That seems like ancient history at this point, right? It wasn't that many years ago. But at this point, there was a big push uh, in many Christian churches and, of course, in the Catholic Church to declare that the Reformation is over. It's history, right? It's finished. And so we saw these kind of statements coming out. This was from Pope Francis and uh, Tony Palmer, who's now deceased, he said, Our sin common to all is that we do not allow our unity in Christ to be visible to those around us. Now, Jesus did pray for unity in John chapter 17. So unity is something that we should strive for. But Jesus also prayed in John 17 that his disciples would be separated from the world through his word. So we can only have unity when we agree on this book right here. Here's another statement that came out in that year, 2017, this is from the week of prayer for Christian unity. It said, division is due to our sin. Okay, do you believe that? Is that true? Here's another one from Pope Francis. Division is one of the most serious sins because it does not allow God to act. Sins against unity are not only schisms, but also the most common weeds of our communities. Now, what do you do to weeds if you get a chance? Pluck it out and you throw it away, right? You get rid of it. Is he saying that uh, if you are divisive or you're not going along with the visible unity in the larger world, or at least the larger Christian world, that you are now a weed that needs to be thrown out? Didn't Jesus say once, Luke chapter 12, that if you follow me, I bring a sword and you'll be divided from your parents, possibly? from your in-laws, possibly, from your brothers and sisters, right? Jesus did talk. He not only talked about unity, he also talked about division as well. So our title today is Divided We Stand. Now, Isaiah, this was our scripture, Isaiah 46, 9 and 10. Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning. So in verse 10, God is going to explain why there is no other God like him. Because I declare the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done. What we're going to look at today is a picture that the Bible gives us of how to stand at the end of time. And God says in Isaiah 46 verse 10 that he declares the end from what? From the beginning. Now there's certainly is one of the verses that tells us that God knows everything, right? There's nothing hidden from him. Whether in the distant future or the ancient past, God is all-knowing. But look at it carefully. It says that he declares the end from what happened at the beginning. And that's what we want to look at today. What happened in the beginning? Well, in my Bible, Genesis chapter 1, it tells us that God created the heavens and the earth in the beginning. God created the heavens and the earth. Turn to Genesis 1. We're going to spend our time there this morning. And I want you to notice, we're not going to read the chapter, but I want you to notice how God creates physical life in creation week. On day one, he divides the light from the darkness. In fact, the word is used here in Genesis 1 verse 4. God divided the light from the darkness. On day number two, God divided the waters above the firmament from the waters that are beneath the firmament. Look at verse 6. It actually says that. Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters and let it divide the waters from the waters. What did God do on day number 3? Well, he creates dry land. And so he divides the waters horizontally this time and dry land appears. 
But he's not finished because by the end of day three, you have grass and shrubs and trees and all the other vegetation that is now growing on that dry land. God is very specific. Look at Genesis 1 verse 11. How would the vegetation reproduce? God said, let the earth bring forth, bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth, and it was so. What does that mean? If you want a tomato, what kind of seed do you need to plant? Except for the last few years, now we're messing with all that stuff, right? And you don't know what's going to come up. But if you want a tomato, you plant a tomato seed. If you want an oak tree, you plant an acorn, right? This is how God designed it. Things reproduce after their kind. There is division in the plant world. And God wanted it this way. Now, what did he do on day number four? Well, he set the sun and the moon and the stars in the sky, and they divide the day from the night. God is using this principle of division in his work of creating the natural world. On day number five, God makes the birds. Now, where do birds live, basically? How do they get around? They fly where? Easy questions today. They fly in the sky, right? And then he also created the fish on day number five. And where do the fish live? They live in the water. Now, occasionally you'll see a fish jump in the air, but they don't stay there very long, do they? And sometimes you'll see a bird dive into the water to catch one of those fish, but how long do the birds usually stay in the water? At least under the water. Not very long, right? So there's a division in where these animals live. What did God do on day number six? Well, he creates the land animals, and they also reproduce according to their kind. So dogs have puppies, baby dogs, and cats have kittens, baby kittens, right? They are divided according to their kind. On day six, God also made man. He created Adam. Look at Genesis 2, verse 7. How does God do that? Genesis 2, verse 7, the Lord God formed man of or out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. God did not snap his fingers, and man just went, and there he was, right? Neither did he speak like he had everything else, and all of a sudden there Adam was. God formed mankind, humanity, by dividing us from the dust of the ground. This is why when we die, the Bible says we return to the dust, right? That work of creation is undone, and the separation is undone, and we get united again with the dirt. Now, God isn't finished. There is one day left, and that's day number seven. And on day number seven, the Bible tells us, Genesis 2, verses 2 and 3, on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. That means to set it apart for something special. Because that in it, he had rested from all his work which God created and made. God continues this pattern of division, or the principle of division. And on day seven, God divides time itself. None of us can divide time, right? It's nothing we can get our hands on. It's just something we live within. But God divides time itself. So this is how God created the physical world. It's through the principle of division. Now, why is this important? It's important because in Romans 1 verse 20, the Apostle Paul says, and I'm paraphrasing here, says, the invisible things of God are understood by his work of creation. So if we want to, if we want to understand what God is doing at the end today spiritually, we need to look at the beginning and use that as a template or a model so that we can better understand what God is doing today. I hope that makes sense. We're going to look at creation as a template or a blueprint for what God is doing spiritually at the end of time. Now, in 2017, the world was saying 500 years ago the Protestant Reformation began. And that's true. That was 500 years since Martin Luther nailed those 95 theses to the church door. But I'm going to suggest to you this morning that uh, the Reformation actually began about 200 years before that, 700 years. And by the way, seven is the perfect number, isn't it? It's the number of completion and perfection. So it shouldn't surprise us if God's end time revival actually begins about 700 years ago rather than 500 years ago. 
Now, <clears throat> we'll get to the reason for that in just a moment. But first of all, look with me at Genesis 1, verse 2. Well, we'll start with verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Now verse 2. And the earth was without form and void. And what was upon the face of the deep? What does your Bible say? Darkness is upon the face of the deep. And then the Spirit of God begins moving. So before creation, before the work of division, there is light or darkness? There is darkness. And God's work of division brings light. That's the very first thing. Now, if we go back 700 years ago, our world was in the middle of what we often call the dark ages. And there's a reason for that. The scriptures foretell a great apostasy. It is a matter of historical record that following the death of the last of the apostles of Jesus, some members of the Christian church began to depart from the simplicity of the truth as taught by Christ, and gradually these church members were led to unite with the world in heathen practices. These centuries of apostasy are correctly designated in history the Dark Ages. During this time, attempts were made to alter or set aside many of the fundamental teachings of the Bible. Don't miss this point. The Dark Ages spiritually resulted because people set aside the Bible and said, let's unite with the world. They forgot the principle of division based on the Word of God. Now, there are two primary reasons why the spiritual darkness descended in those ages. And uh, we need to go to Daniel chapter 8 to find those. Keep your finger here. We'll come back to Genesis 1, but let's go to Daniel chapter 8. Bible prophecy actually tells us very clearly what led to the Dark Ages. There were two things that were lost sight of uh, that resulted in this spiritual darkness. Daniel chapter 8, <clears throat> beginning in verse 9. We're jumping into the middle of the prophecy. Here we go. And out of one of them came forth a little horn which waxed exceeding great toward the south and toward the east and toward the pleasant land. The little horn is one of these powers in Bible prophecy. Uh, it goes by many names, but all of the Protestant reformers understood that it pointed to the Roman Catholic Church system, which was in charge in Europe there during these dark ages. Now, verse 10, It waxed great, even to the host of heaven, and it cast down some of the host and of the stars to the ground and stamped upon them. Verse 11, Yea, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host, and by him the daily sacrifice was taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. So here's the first thing that was lost sight of in the Dark Ages. It was the reality that Jesus, after his resurrection and ascension, didn't just go on vacation in heaven, he began working as humanity's high priest. And that's really good news. Because when you pray... That means your prayers aren't just floating through space and hopefully they'll reach God. The fact that Jesus is your high priest tells us that when you pray, you have a priest who is waiting and ready to take that prayer and then present it to the Father. It's really good news. In fact, it's absolutely essential for our salvation. That was lost sight of. And instead, during these dark ages, people were taught that if they needed to confess a sin, they were to go right to the priest and that you would confess your sins to human beings. So Christ's ministry was lost sight of. Now look at Daniel 8, verse 12. Here's the second thing that was lost sight of. A host was given him against the daily sacrifice by reason of transgression, and it cast down the truth to the ground as well, right? For centuries, the Bible was locked up in a language that most people couldn't understand. And even if they could, they couldn't get to the Bible because the few copies that existed were usually chained to a monastery or an abbey wall somewhere. And so the light of God's word was lost sight of as well. Two things, the sanctuary and Bible truth were lost sight of, and the result was the dark ages. Now go back to Genesis chapter 1. We're going to see... How does God bring spiritual light and truth back to the world in preparation for Christ's second coming? He's going to follow the same blueprint or pattern that he used in creation week. Day by day, we'll see the comparison. Now, what did God do on day one of creation week? What did he create? He created light. Genesis 1 verse 3 
God said, let there be light. Now, the Bible tells us in Psalm 119, 105, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So it shouldn't surprise us if God begins his work of preparation for his second coming by bringing back the Bible truth. Let's go back 700 years ago, almost exactly, and see what was happening. In the 14th century arose in England the morning star of the Reformation. John Wycliffe was the herald of reform, not for England alone, but for all of Christendom. The great protest against Rome, which it was permitted him to utter, was never to be silenced. At last the work was completed, the first English translation of the Bible ever made. Are you thankful for what John Wycliffe did and others like him that literally risked or sometimes gave their lives so that you could read the Bible in a language you can understand? Amen. He's called the morning star of the Reformation. The word of God was opened to England. The reformer feared not now the prison or the stake. He had placed in the hands of the English people a light which should never be extinguished. His life was protected and his labors were prolonged until a foundation was laid for the great work of the Reformation. John Wycliffe, we are not sure exactly which year he was born, but it was somewhere around the thir early 1320s, 700 years ago. God's work of reform and revival leading all the way up to where we are today began 700 years ago. And he begins by bringing back the light of Bible truth. Now, what did God do on day number two? He divides the waters above the firmament and the waters beneath the firmament. Let's look at the word firmament right here. Let's look at this verse prophetically. What does water represent in Bible prophecy? People, right? Masses of people, lots of people especially. So we're going to look at this through a prophetic lens. Now what about firmament? Well, in creation week, it represented the atmosphere, okay? But we're going to look at it through a prophetic lens, and I want to take you to Psalm 150, verse 1. Last psalm in that book. Praise ye the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in the firmament of his power. We're going to take the Bible's uh, comparison of these two for the rest of our study this morning. Every time you read the word firmament in Genesis chapter 1, just substitute or replace sanctuary in your mind. Now, this shouldn't surprise us because the two things that were lost sight of in the dark ages were the light of Bible truth and Christ's work in the heavenly sanctuary. On day one, God brings back Bible truth. On day two, we're going to see what he does to bring back the sanctuary truth. Again, looking at Genesis 1 verse 6 through prophetic um, eyeglasses. And God said, let there be a sanctuary in the midst of the people, right? Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters. So what happened as the um, <clears throat> centuries of the Reformation progressed? We just read about John Wycliffe. The Bible uh, is represented by the table of showbread. Uh, Jesus and other places call the word of God something that we eat, right? something that nourishes us. So we see that God brings back what is represented by the table of showbread through John Wycliffe and many others who were uh, bringing Bible truth back to the people. Now there's also the altar of burnt offering connected with the sanctuary. And these, this pointed forward, of course, to Christ's death on the cross as the only sacrifice that can pay the penalty for our sins, that works atonement. And so Martin Luther Although he wrote and talked about many things, his focus was especially justification by faith, right? If you remember his story, he began uh, his life believing, as everyone had been taught at that time, that if you wanted pardon and forgiveness of sins, you had to do something to earn God's favor or to earn the church's favor. And as the story goes, he was climbing up steps in Rome, kissing each one as he went, trying to do his works of penance, when suddenly the verse flashed through his mind, the just shall live, not by kissing the steps, but by faith. The just shall live by faith. And so his focus is justification by faith. I'm thankful for what Martin Luther did, are you? God worked through him. Now, 
John Calvin lived at the same time as Martin Luther, more or less. And um, he was a reformer in, in France. And he wrote and taught about many things as well. But he really focused on prayer. And his focus was you can pray directly to God. You can pray directly to Jesus. You don't have to go through the hierarchy of a human priesthood. Uh, and so this is the altar of incense. This is represented um, by that incense that would rise up in the altar. This was right in front of the curtain that separated the holy place from the most holy place. And some of that incense would spill over the curtain into the most holy place. This represents Christ's ministry for us. When you pray, Revelation chapter 8, verses 3 and 4, check it out when you get home, Jesus is represented as the angel standing there in front of the altar of incense. And when you pray, he takes your prayer, he mixes it with his incense, his perfect faith, and then he presents it to the Father in heaven. It's a very encouraging picture because we've all had days where you have felt like, I have felt like my prayers are bouncing off the ceiling. They're not getting any higher than the room I'm in. But the Bible promises us, even when we have this much faith, if we pray and ask Jesus to take that prayer, he will mix it with his infinite faith and then present that prayer to the Father. Amen. What about the labor? This was the wash basin. And the priests would cleanse themselves in before they went into the tabernacle. Well, it represented baptism, right? And um, <clears throat> the Bible is very clear on the significance and the importance of baptism. It represents the new life that we enter into when we accept Jesus as our personal Savior. Now, baptism began as Jesus was baptized by immersion. This is why he went to John the Baptist in the River Jordan, because there was much water there, right? And actually, if you look at pictures of early churches, even early Catholic churches, they all have the baptistries, like the one behind me here, except they were carved in stone, right? That's why we can still see them. They all, all those early Christian churches for centuries had a baptistry, but then something changed as we moved into those centuries of the Dark Ages, and the immersion part was set aside, and now you're pouring or sprinkling things like this. Well, you have the Baptists, right? And uh, John Smith and others who were leaders in this uh, Reformation movement, they recovered that truth of baptism by immersion. And so the symbolism of what the labor represents was brought back as well. Now, you also have the candlestick that was in the holy place. Of course, this gave light inside the tabernacle. It represents the work of the Holy Spirit and the light that is to shine out from the church through the Holy Spirit's use of each one of us as missionaries. You know, during the Dark Ages, there wasn't a lot of missionary work going on. There were a few, like the Waldenses and some of the other marginalized people. And they had to be very, very careful, didn't they, about how they went about that missionary work. Because if they were caught, it could mean their life. And so they would sew fragments of the Bible into their clothing. And when the time seemed right, they'd bring out a few verses and hand it to somebody as they were making another transaction. And then they'd move on their way. Well, you come up to the late 1700s, early 1800s, and you have John and Charles Wesley, um, founders of the Methodist Church and others, that were really reignited the fire of evangelism within Christianity. And so the significance and truth of the candlestick now is brought back. And you can just see the march of centuries, right? 14th century down to the 16th century, 17th century, 18th century. Year by year, God is bringing back the truths of the sanctuary. He is placing that firmament of sanctuary truth within his church once again. Day number three, Genesis 1 verses 9 and 10. What did God do next on day three? He said, let dry land appear, and God called the dry land earth. Okay, so <clears throat> this brings us up now right where we stopped with the missionary movement. Late 1700s, early 1800s, and really back through the Protestant Reformation as well. If you wanted to follow Bible truth through many of these years, even in England, which was supposedly Protestant, but the Church of England was now in control, just as the Catholic Church had been in other places for centuries. If you wanted to follow the Bible according to your conscience, and your conscience and the Bible happened to go against what was officially declared, 
that wasn't a real safe situation for you. And so people had to find a safe place to worship. And this is why some of those early pilgrims first went to Holland or the Netherlands, and then they eventually made their way where? To this continent right here, to North America. It's interesting that as we look at Bible prophecy and Revelation, we actually see that God's people would have to flee to the wilderness. Revelation 12, 6, the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared of God that they should feed her there for a thousand two hundred and three score days, right? Remember, water represents people, so a wilderness represents a place where there are not many people, at least in comparison, right? A relatively unpopulated part of the earth. And that's exactly what North America was in those early centuries after it was discovered, relatively unpopulated. We read again in Great Controversy, page 292. It was the desire for liberty of conscience that inspired the pilgrims to brave the perils of the long journey across the sea, to endure the hardships and dangers of the wilderness, and with God's blessing to lay on the shores of America the foundation of a mighty nation. I'm thankful God led that way. How about you? Our nation has a lot of problems, <laughs> and we wonder how long it can last with freedom. But the foundation was laid well, and we still enjoy more freedom than most people around the world have. We should be very thankful for that. Now, that freedom enabled the Christian church to expand and flourish like it hadn't for centuries in Europe. On day three, God also created that vegetation and the tree that is yielding fruit. Didn't Jesus tell his disciples that they should go and bear fruit? In fact, he promised you will bear fruit if you are connected with me. That's a promise for us as well, right? If you have a connection with Jesus Christ, if the Holy Spirit is living in you, your life will bear fruit for God's glory. Amen. It's a promise we need to claim and ask him to fulfill every single day. So what happens now? Late 1700s, early 1800s. For the 50 years preceding 1792, little attention was given to the work of foreign missions. No new societies were formed, and there were but few churches that made any effort for the spread of Christianity in heathen lands. But toward the close of the 18th century, a great change took place. From this time, the work of foreign missions attained an unprecedented growth. We're looking at the early uh, decades, especially of the 1800s as this burden of missionary work. This is when all these missionary societies pop up here and in England. You have Bible societies that are printing Bibles, but also tracts, right? Explaining Bible truth in different languages, and they're sending them out by the shipload to all parts of the world. The missionary service expands and explodes during these early decades of the 1800s. That brings us to day number four. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 14, day 4 begins this way. And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. I'll have to admit to you, this verse has become <clears throat> very special to me. And um, I'll try to explain why as we study this here. As the early decades of the 1800s went by, there was something happening worldwide, but especially in North America, called the Second Advent Awakening. As people were studying their Bibles, they became convinced that Jesus was coming soon. And this was not an isolated event just in New England or just here. It was in Christianity around the world. It actually began with um, a Roman Catholic Jesuit priest, in Chile, South America. And he wrote about his study of Bible prophecy, which Jesuit priests were not supposed to be doing, so he wrote under a pen name. And some, a guy, Edward Irving in England, read what this Catholic priest had written. He was so intrigued that he learned Spanish just so he could read the original writing, not the translated version. And this is how it went. It spread as people were studying all over the world, all different Christian denominations as well. And many people believed that Jesus was coming back sometime soon, especially somewhere around the 1840s. Now, this verse, Genesis 1 verse 14 says, God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven. 
People were expecting Jesus to come back, and especially the Millerites in North America here were expecting the second coming on a specific day in 1844. Obviously, that didn't happen. We're still here today. The second coming didn't take place, so what went on? Look again at Genesis 1.14. Let there be lights in the firmament of heaven. Now, we know what the firmament represents. What does the firmament represent? Sanctuary, okay? But what about light? Well, we know that generally light can represent the Word of God. It also represents Jesus. Here's another meaning of light. 2 Peter 1 verse 19. We have also a more sure word of what? Prophecy. Whereunto you do well that we take heed as unto a what? A light that shineth in a dark place. So light can also represent prophecy specifically. Now go back to Genesis 1.14. Let there be lights in the firmament of heaven, or let there be prophecies about the sanctuary of heaven. Why were so many people expecting Jesus to come back in 1844 especially? There is a prophecy in the Old Testament in Daniel 8 verse 14 that says under 200 and 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. They correctly understood that those were not literal days, they were actually years, a day for a year in Bible prophecy. And they worked out the time correctly. They understood that that prophecy ended on October 22, 1844. They just misunderstood the event that was to happen at the end of time. But look at this verse. Let there be prophecies about what? The sanctuary in heaven. And that is exactly what Daniel 8, verse 14 is all about. It's about Jesus moving into the most holy place in the heavenly sanctuary, beginning his work of atonement there, or the cleansing of the sanctuary in preparation for his return. Now, in your Bible, it's not on the screen, look closely at verse 14. Let there be prophecies or lights in the firmament or sanctuary of heaven to divide the day from the night. And let them be for signs. Were there signs in the heavens in these decades leading up to 1844? We had the stars falling from the sky. We had a dark day where the sun turned black. You had the moon turning red. There was even the great earthquake. This was decades before in 1755, right? The Lisbon earthquake. But there were signs leading up to this event. Let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. It was a day for a year principle in Bible prophecy that uh, unlocked these time prophecies leading up to 1844. Jesus did not come back. There was a great disappointment. And for a short time, the few people that chose to not give up their faith were in great perplexity, right? What went wrong? What did we misunderstand? By the way, there were about 50,000 Millerites at the beginning of October 22, and by October 23, there were about 50 that had not given up their faith. A thousand to one. Let's be in the one, right? Not in the 9,999. 9, it was just a couple weeks later that Ellen Harmon, a 17-year-old girl in New England, received her first vision. She later married James White, and today she's remembered as Ellen White. I want you to look what happens next in Genesis 1 on, verse, uh, on day 4, verses 16 to 18. God made two great lights, the greater light and the lesser light. She actually used this phrase to describe her writings compared to the Bible. She said, my writings are the lesser light and the Bible is the greater light. What is she saying? If there's any point in which I disagree with the Bible, then take the Bible and discard me. And that is a rule that we should use for everything and everybody, including this message here this morning. Compare it to the Bible. Test it and see if it's true. I want to share with you her first vision. Would you be surprised if it involved two lights? A greater light and a lesser light? Here it is. I seem to be surrounded with light and to be rising higher and higher from the earth. I turned to look for the Advent people in the world, but could not find them when a voice said to me, Look again and look a little higher. At this, I raised my eyes and I saw a straight and narrow path cast up high above the world. 
On this path, the Advent people were traveling to the city, which was at the farther end of the path. Don't miss this fact. In her first vision, she sees a path leading people to be divided or separated from the world. If we're going to stand for God at the end, we have to be able to do it alone. Without my wife. Without my family. They have to be ready to do that without me. Without your church family. We have to be willing to be divided and separated. Her first vision. Now she goes on. They had a bright light set up behind them at the beginning of the path, which an angel told me was the midnight cry. This light shone all along the path and gave light for their feet so that they might not stumble. If they kept their eyes fixed on Jesus, who was just before them, leading them to the city, they were safe. So Jesus is the light. Which one is greater? Jesus is the greater light. This midnight cry is the lesser light behind them. Soon some grew weary and said the city was a great way off and they expected to have entered it before. Then Jesus would encourage them by raising his glorious right arm and from his arm came a light which waved over the Advent band and they shouted, Alleluia. Others rashly denied the light behind them and said that it was not God that had led them out so far. The light behind them went out, leaving their feet in perfect darkness and they stumbled and lost sight of the mark and of what? Jesus and fell off the path down into the dark and wicked world below. Don't miss what we're being told here. Can I push aside the lesser light and still go safely on the path to Jesus? When they ignored the lesser light behind them, they also lost sight of Jesus. We've been given two lights. They are both essential, and they are both important. Jesus, the Word of God, that is the test by which the lesser light is guided. But we have been given the spirit of prophecy. And if I choose to ignore it or close it or push it aside or say this part is inspired but this part isn't, I'm not smart enough to do that. And I will lose my way and I will fall off the path. We either accept it all or we reject it all. Here is her statement. Little heed is given to the Bible, and the Lord has given a lesser light to lead men and women to the greater light. Day five. God says, let there be fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. What are fowl? What kind of animal is that? And how do birds get around? They fly with what? Wings. Wings. Okay. So they have wings. Let there be winged creatures that may fly above the earth in the open, what? Sanctuary of heaven. Does the book of Revelation tell us anything about winged creatures that have a message about what Jesus is doing in heaven for us right now? We call it the three what? Three angels messages. By the way, those angels don't represent literal angels. They represent you and me. This is our mission and our message. On day five, we see a reference, right? A parallel here. There is a message that God has given to the church today. It is the three angels' messages. Sometimes we hear people saying, well, let's push those aside. Let's just focus on the everlasting gospel. You can't do that because the three angels' messages are the everlasting gospel put in the end time context. And if you're giving the three angels messages, you will also be talking about Jesus as the focus of the gospel. Day number six, God said, let us make man, how? In our image. Turn with me again to Genesis chapter two. What is God trying to do right now today in preparation for his second coming? Day number six, God wants to recreate you in his image. He wants to place his image in you. Now, how did God create Adam? Genesis 2, verse 7. The Lord God formed man of or out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. What does the dust represent? In Genesis 3.14, when God is speaking to Adam and Eve and the serpent, and he's 
explaining the curses as a result of their disobedience. He tells the serpent that it is going to live where? In the dust. Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. Dust is where the serpent lives. Dust represents sin. Now, this does not mean that back at creation, God created Adam and Eve out of sin. Don't go there, right? It's just an illustration. But today, God is, he has to separate us from sin. Just as he formed Adam out of the dust, he has to pull us away from sin. He has to divide us from sin so that we can be united with him. Here's what Ellen White wrote in Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing, page 62. If you cling to self, refusing to yield your will to God, you are choosing death. To sin wherever found, God is a consuming fire. If you choose sin and refuse to separate from it, the presence of God which consumes sin must consume you. Now those are heavy words, aren't they? And I would suggest to you this morning that this is the real reason so many people have a problem with Ellen White. It's not her prophecies. It's not the fact that some of her paragraphs uh, reflect other writers, right? It, that's really not it. She is hated for the same reason that every prophet from God has been hated through history. It's because they identified sin. And they bore a straight testimony saying, you can't have it both ways, folks. You can either be united to God or you can continue being connected with sin. But you cannot have it both ways. And that is the real reason people don't want to read or listen or follow. I hope you see where we are today, right? What is God trying to do right now so that you can stand in his presence when he returns? He wants to sanctify us. He has to. He has to separate and divide us from this world so that we can be united with him. There is no virtue in division itself just for the sake of being divisive. There's a purpose for it. It's so we can be connected with Jesus. But there's only place in my heart and in your heart for one king. There's only one throne there. It's either Jesus or myself. It cannot be both. Now, how does this all wrap up at the end of time? Look at what happens on day seven. On the seventh day, God ended his work and God blessed the seventh day. God divides time itself. And at the end, it's an issue of time, isn't it? Which is the visible test for every person living in this world. Am I obedient to God? Have I claimed him as my king? Or will I serve myself or anything else? And it will be the day as the visible test. That's why it matters, because it reveals what's in the heart. It reveals the decisions that have already been reached. And so at the end of creation week, God divides time itself. At the end of time, this day, the Sabbath, stands as the test that will show whether I have stood with God and allowed him to separate me from sin or if I'm standing with the world. 1945 in New Mexico, this 300-foot tower contained something at the top called the gadget. On an early spring morning of 1945, that gadget was detonated and the world's first atomic explosion took place vaporized the sand, most everything else around it. You can see the picture on the right. How much of that tower remains? <laughs> Nothing. The tower was gone. The United States military had a code name for this project. And of course, a few weeks later, they would drop the atomic bomb twice on Japan, bringing World War II in the Pacific to an end. They had a code name for this project. It was called Trinity. Now, I don't know why, but here's my guess. Somebody in the United States government understood, they realized that if this thing works the way we think it will, when we hit that red button, 
we're going to unleash a supernatural power that is stronger than anything we humans have ever seen before. And it will be almost godlike. So they call it Trinity. That's my version of it. Do you know that the Bible predicts that there will be another explosion at the end of time? This is our last verse today. Revelation 18, verse 1. Revelation 18, verse 1. After these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. You see, when an atomic bomb explodes, there are two things. There is light, and there's also power. It's powerful enough to flatten an entire city of hundreds of thousands of people. And the light over Hiroshima was so bright, I'm sure you've heard these stories, that people standing in front of brick walls, they were vaporized, but their shadows were burned into the bricks behind them. That's how bright it was. What we are seeing in Revelation 18.1, this is the end time revival that we started with. It's going to release divine power and light or truth to this world. And people will take their stand. Now, how does an atomic bomb work? For all you nuclear physicists here today, right? They split what? The atom. And when the atom splits, when that proton, I'm not going to say it right, so I won't even try it, right? But when the, the nucleus splits, the light and the power are released. And it's a chain reaction. That's the key. It starts with one atom. And then as the free particles from that first atom slam into the next atom, it splits as well. And the chain reaction is instantaneous and unstoppable. This is how God intends his end time revival to go. As you are divided from the world and united with Christ, your life will impact somebody else's. And they will make the same decision. And then their life will impact somebody else's. And then two more people will be impacted. And then four, and then eight, and then 16. And it will wrap around the world with great power and great light. And then Jesus will come back. We must be divided from this world so we can be united with Christ. Is that your desire today? Is it your choice to pursue this with more intensity than you have before? If so, would you stand together as we ask God to make this a reality in our lives? Let's stand and pray.